John Lee often made the point that as we practice, our practice is a skill. The Dharma is all about skill. The words are there to help us master the skill, understand the problems we're facing, and understand the various approaches we might take. But the words are not the Dharma. The words point to the Dharma. The genuine Dharma is something we have to do. In fact, that is one of the old meanings of the word Dharma. It's an action. We want to look at our actions very carefully to see where they're skillful and where they're not. This is why you see both in John Lee's writings and in the Buddha's teachings a lot of analogies to skills. As the Buddha said, the skillful meditator is like a skillful archer or a skillful cook, a carpenter. Or as John Lee would say, as we develop directed thought and evaluation in the practice. It's basically learning how to observe our actions and the results of our actions and figure out what's going wrong. He would compare it to weaving a basket, sewing a shirt, making clay tiles. So we have to remember that as we're reading the Dhamma and listening to the Dhamma. The Dhamma is some something that you just understand. As John Lee once said, if you had to explain the Dhamma, you'd probably you'd explain everything in words for the point of understanding on one level. It wouldn't take three hours, he said. But then taking just one of those words, to, he said, might take three years to really understand it as you put it into practice. So you have to remember that we're Developing a skill here that's not something you just memorize, it's something you actually have to do and you have to observe. And this is why the Buddha said that truthfulness is one of the primary requirements. It's being both honest about what you're actually doing and the results that you're getting, and being truthful in the sense of truly sticking to something once you've made up your mind that this is what's really good, or once you've noticed or seen clearly that this is something that's really good, then you stick with it. You don't betray that understanding. You don't betray your knowledge. So you have to be true in order to learn the truth, and then you take that truth and to really benefit from it, you just have to continue being true. Now for a lot of us, the the thought of honesty means we have to be honest about our shortcomings, and that's one side of honesty. It's a painful side. But there's another painful side, being honest about the fact that we have certain capabilities that we haven't fully developed. We could make more of ourselves. There was that kind of honesty that drove the Buddha on his path. Here he was, a prince, he had power, he had wealth, he had all kinds of sensual pleasures. And according to the traditional accounts, the people around him kept saying, hey, what more do you want? And think of all the great people of the past, this is how they lived their lives. And the Buddha said, well, that's a sign then that they really weren't great people. They really weren't worthy of honor, worthy of respect. The truly great people are the ones who check to see if we have a greater capacity within us and try to explore that, push the envelope. So that's what he did, and that's why he found the Dharma. He would look at his actions and ask himself, here I am suffering. What am I doing that might be causing that suffering? So I had to truly look at what he was doing and truly look at the results that he was getting. But then he also had to ask himself, well, is there an alternative way of doing this? Is this all a human being can do, or is there something better, something more? 
And so he stretched his imagination. And then whatever ideas he came up with, he would give them a try, see if they actually worked. So this is one of the reasons why the Buddha placed truthfulness as the most important of the virtues, both in the sense of speaking truly and in being true in the sense of not betraying your knowledge, not betraying your understanding. Because with the precepts as a whole, they all have to come down to this quality of truthfulness, seeing on the one hand that you truly have been harming people and you want to stop. And then making up your mind, you're going to stick with that determination. Because the precepts aren't there as commands. The Buddha isn't forcing them on you. You have to see for yourself that it really would be better to give up that kind of harmful action. It's a promise you make to yourself, and then you want to be true to your promises. And if you start lying to yourself or start betraying your knowledge, then that sets you up in a long, long series of other ways that you have to lie to yourself. It's the same as when you lie to other people. You tell one lie, and then you have to cover up that lie with another lie, and then a third lie, and then a fourth. And it gets very tricky and very complicated. And after a while, you've forgotten who you told which lie to. It's a lot simpler just to stick with the truth. Say, okay, there, I do have these shortcomings, but I also have these potentials. It's by being true that the potentials open up. So the Buddha placed a large sense of importance on this virtue of truthfulness. It's one of the reasons why he said that people who feel no shame at telling a lie are capable of any kind of thing, any kind of evil. And this doesn't mean that everybody who lies is capable of all kinds of evil. There are people who, who will tell lies, but they feel ashamed about it. But it's the ones who feel no shame at all. Those are the ones you have to watch out for. This is why it's especially troubling when you hear somebody say, well, you know, there are circumstances where a lie is perfectly acceptable and it's perfectly okay. And they'll give you these extreme examples where if you don't tell a lie, somebody might die. Well, you never know in those cases. Even if you do lie, the person might die. Some people are very poor liars. And then they take that extreme example and say, well, there is this principle then that lies can be okay in some ex circumstances. Well, that's the kind of person who feels no shame at telling a lie and try to justify it. And once you feel that lying is okay, then you are capable of anything. So you want to make sure that you take refuge in the truth. As the Chan Mahabua once said, that if you hold to what's true, then the truth holds no dangers for you. It's when you pretend that the truth becomes a threat. When you make false assumptions, the truth becomes a threat. So if you're beginning to, to practice and start looking at where you're suffering, you start noticing there's certain things that you hold on to that cause you to be fearful, that cause you to be feel threatened. Then you have to look to the truth of that assumption. Is it really true? Is this really me? Is this really mine? And this is why the truth of not-self is so important. It's a tool for letting go of the things where you feel threatened by the truth. And you find that when you can let go of those things, that the threat goes away. So the more honest you are with yourself about what your shortcomings are and what your strengths are. That's what the Buddha called 
having a sense of yourself. This takes time, requires truthfulness, but having a sense of yourself means knowing where your strengths are, knowing where your weaknesses are, what areas you have to fix, what areas you have to make improvements, and then what areas of the mind, what qualities of the mind you can depend on to make those improvements. To being honest with yourself about yourself doesn't mean just saying, well, I'm miserable and I accept the fact that I'm miserable. Maybe I can be okay with that. That's not what the Buddha is asking for. That's not what he's recommending. He's recommending, okay, where are your strengths and where are your weaknesses? Try to make a clear evaluation here. The clearer you are about this, then the easier the path will become. This is why when the Buddha asked that if a person came to him to study with him, he asked two things. One is that the person be observant, and two that the person be truthful. Those two qualities go together. The more truthful you are as a general policy, the more you can begin to trust your observations, what's true, what's not what's worthwhile, what's not. That way the truth becomes your refuge. Your truthfulness becomes your refuge. Otherwise, how are you going to know what's skillful, what's not? How are you going to know who you can trust and who you can't? I mean, your sources of knowledge are basically two, what you get from other people and what you get from yourself. And both cases have to be tested in the truthfulness in your own powers of observation, in the truthfulness to which you put a teaching to the test and actually give it a fair test. So that's why the truth is your ultimate refuge. The truth of your own heart and mind. John Lee once said, if you aren't true, then the Buddha's teachings will be true for you, and you'll never know what the Buddha's teachings truly are. You turn that around. If you're true, then the Buddha's teachings will be true for you, and you do have a chance of knowing what they are. 